Welcome everybody. This is the sixth lecture in my series on purification, ethics and karma in early Buddhist discourse. I have a little problem here with the PDF. Somehow after the heading of review MA9 it gives another A9 and I have not been able to convince the PDF to leave out that part, so users please ignore that one of those things where a monk and a PDF writer difficult to agree with each other. Yeah, we start with uh, reviewing what we looked at last time, Madhyama Agama 9. There were first these qualities of uh, the monk, of Venerable Punna. Um, I just go through them briefly. So, having a few wishes and being contented, living in seclusion, being energetic, having right mindfulness, having mental one-pointedness, having wisdom, having destroyed the taints, and exhorting, inspiring, and fully delighting others. And as we had noted that in both versions we have this uh, basic pattern that first uh, one is established oneself in uh, some quality and the second is that one establishes others in the same quality. And I had highlighted that as an, as an important aspect. And there's been a reply to this by Daniel Percy. Or a question, perhaps? She says, This aspect of teaching is a bit puzzling to me. Is this only when one becomes an arahant? Or is one encouraged to teach any qualities one developed? And what about those that can't teach and might just inspire by example? Does one miss out on anything if one doesn't teach? Is teaching a practice encouraged by the Buddha? Does teaching fit into the practice or is it a result from the compassion of the Arahant? And since I personally feel that this is an important aspect of this discourse, uh, specifically I believe I said that already last time, uh, as there is sometimes this notion that early Buddhism wrongly identified as Hinayana is mainly a practice concerned with oneself. I would like to just briefly go into this topic of teaching. Uh, the first passage I would like to take up is the simile of sinking in the mud from the Salika Sutta, which is uh, similarly also found in the Chinese Agama parallel. And I, I read this uh, simile for you from the Pali version. That one who is himself sinking in the mud should pull out another who is sinking in the mud is impossible. That one who is not himself sinking should pull out another is possible. That one who is himself untamed, undisciplined, with defilements unextinguished, should tame another, discipline him, and help extinguish his defilements is impossible. That one who is himself tamed should tame another is possible. I think this sets a very clear foundation for teaching. It means that we can only transmit those qualities in which we have established ourselves and to try to teach to others what we have not yet done ourselves or realized or established ourselves in is similarly like sinking in the mud and trying to pull out someone else uh, an attempt that is not going to be helpful to both of us. 
but how to teach others and I think that was one of the aspects that Dania had brought up might one just inspire by example this is precisely the case and we get uh, a description of the Buddha's own practice of seclusion and he is reported to have explained the following this is from the Bhayabhairava Sutta it is because I see do two benefits that I still resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest. I see a pleasant abiding for myself here and now and I have compassion for future generations. So the Buddha's practice of seclusion is first of all because he enjoys it himself but the second reason is that he has compassion for future generations. And in a Chinese parallel to this type of statement we get the more detailed explanation that in this way the Buddha sets an example. He sets an example for future generations to emulate so that they realize that the understanding of the Dharma requires this type of conduct and it is a type of conduct that is still kept up by somebody who has already reached the final goal. So teaching does not need to be well, what I'm doing here, <laughs> not just setting an example, but talking on endlessly for one and a half hour, but it can just be done by example. But then there are, and this is another aspect of teaching, uh, there are uh, five spheres of liberation. The Pali is Vimuttayatana, and we also get a similar set in the Chinese Agamas. These spheres of liberation describe uh, the occasion when the breakthrough to awakening can take place. So we should remember that this is not about how somebody has progressed all the way from not knowing anything up to liberation. There's all these different practices he or she will have to be done, but these describe precisely the point in time when liberation, when awakening can happen in what circumstances this happens. And this teaching gives us five different aspects. One is when hearing the Dharma. The second is when teaching the Dharma to others. The third is when reciting the Dharma. The fourth is when reflecting about the Dharma. And the fifth is uh, during meditation. Literally, I, I think I give you the literal it says, having well grasped some sign of concentration, having well given attention to it, having well held it in one's mind, having well penetrated it with wisdom. But we can conclude that this refers to actual meditation. So teaching the Dharma to others, which in this list is the second of these five spheres, is one of the occasions where one could actually awaken. And there's um, a nice story of uh, Venerable Rahula. Venerable Rahula is the Buddha's son, and we will get to him in a few more discourses in the Madhyama Agama. We get an instruction to him. But there's another discourse that describes how he awakened. And in the Chinese Agama parallel, uh, we get a whole account of what happened before he got the instruction by the Buddha that led him to become an Arahant. And that is actually quite interesting because it gives a very detailed explanation. According to this story, Venerable Rahula comes to the Buddha and says, uh, Bhante, I would like to go into seclusion to practice intensively and reach the final goal. And the Buddha says, well, um, have you already taught the subject of the five aggregates to people? And Rahula says, uh, no, Bhante. You should give some teachings. So Rahula goes and explains uh, the five aggregates to others. We may assume other monks, lay people, we don't know. When he comes back and says, okay, I have done this uh, teaching. Uh, now uh, I want to go in seclusion, intensive practice, Bhante. Buddha says, mm, have you taught on the six sense spheres? Rao says, uh, no. So off he goes and he has to teach the six sense spheres. 
and we get the same thing again on the principle of causality. So the Buddha gets him to teach on these three very central topics of early Buddhist philosophy, the five aggregates, the six sense spheres, and causality. And when he has given teachings on all these three, and Rahula comes back again, the Buddha says, now you go into seclusion, meditate on these three. And this is what Rahula does. And he comes to understand that they all point in the same direction. They all point to Nirvana. And when he reports this understanding to the Buddha, the Buddha says, yes, now his mind is ripe. Now I can lead him to Arahantship. So, the different things, briefly putting it together again, we see that teaching has an important role to play. We see that just by providing an inspiring example, one can already teach. But actual verbal teaching of the Dharma is a way of maturing one's own mind. The story of Rahula nicely exemplifies this. And one might even get the actual breakthrough while one is giving a teaching. However, throughout this basic pattern applies that if one is sinking in the mud oneself, one can't pull out another. Yeah, this was what I wanted to say on the topic of teaching. If there are no comments or questions on this, then, or if there are comments or questions, then now is the good time. Good, then I continue with the next part. Again, please forgive the header that has been resisting my attempts. Chup, there is gone. <laughs> oh gosh. So we are now with these uh, seven purifications. They were virtue, mind, view, hindrance of doubt, Knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path. Knowledge and vision of the way. Knowledge of the way to abandoning. Several entries in the blog have highlighted that these are not easily to understand and there is some unclarity about them. So I thought we, we just have another look at them. And as I said, there's the basic listing in uh, this discourse. We don't get any further information on what they might mean. Then if we search for the same terminology or similar terminology elsewhere, the first two, I mean, is fairly clear. Virtue and mind is, is I think, is self-explanatory. Purification of view, the third one. So there's two more occurrences where they are just mentioned in the Diga Nikaya and in the Anguttara Nikaya. And in another discourse in the Anguttara Nikaya, we get a somewhat slightly different term. It's Diti Parisudhi Padhanianga. The, and this is said to be insight into the Four Noble Truth. Parisuddhi and Visuddhi are nearly the same terms, so it's the factor of exertion for the purification of view. We could translate it like this. Insight into the Four Noble Truths is, uh, is, uh, takes place with stream entry. And there has been a very interesting contribution by Venerable Xinchen. And she has brought up some quotations from works from the northern tradition, the, the Tattva Siddhi and the Yogacara Bhumi. And both of them also identify a purification of view with stream entry. And uh, Tattva Siddhi explicitly continues also by identifying the next two uh, purifications with aspects of stream entry. The Yoga Achara Bhumi does so in a less explicit way, but it seems to imply the same. Now, uh, the problem with these identifications, with thinking that uh, purification of view corresponds to stream entry, 
is that we have a problem of matching it with the basic simile. The simile we were given in the discourse was that there are seven consecutive uh, chariots that are used. So one uses one chariot and uh, presumably when the horses are tired and one reaches the next station, one leaves that chariot behind and gets into the next one. But if we are identifying stream entry with number three in our list, with purification of view, according to the chariot simile, we cannot think that this leads on to a purification from doubt or knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path. But this is precisely what is implied in the passages that Venerable Xinchen had quoted. And um, I had a little discussion with her about this, and she has mentioned that the Sarvastivada tradition uh, uh, holds that insight uh, takes place in 16 consecutive mind moments. This takes us a little bit into later traditions, but just briefly said, uh, according to the Sarvastivada tradition, that each of the Four Noble Truths is understand, understood separately, and each of these four requires four mind moments to be fully comprehended. When we think of this theory, it is necessary to keep in mind that according to I think all Buddhist tradition, a mind moment is something extremely short. The numbers they give is different, but for the time it takes to snip a finger, uh, within that time period of that single snip, <clears throat> there are so and so many thousands, millions, I don't know, high numbers of mind moments have passed. So what we are talking about is, is, is anyway a very small fraction of time. The problem in using the 16 mind moments theory to understand the series of purification is one is that these 16 mind moments is a, were not agreed on by all schools. In fact, in the Theravada tradition, we have a sutra called the Gavampati Sutta. Well, I'll just give you the reference if anybody likes to look at it. <coughs> And that is actually a sutta, and it explicitly says that there's a monk, he quotes the Buddha and says, the Buddha said that when you realize one truth, you realize all the others at the same time. So that, at least for the Theravada tradition, it is canonical that the Four Noble Truths are realized at the same time. So at least when we discuss the Pali version, we can be safe in assuming that the 16 mind moments are not a way of understanding the Sutta. And there's a general point uh, I would like to make at this point. I, I really appreciate this um, Shastra material or also somebody bringing up things from the Pali commentary. It always gives an interesting perspective. But the main emphasis in what we are trying to do here is early Buddhist discourses. And we cannot rely on historically later explanations to understand what the suttas originally meant. We have to apply the historical critical method and see that when faced with difficult sutta passages, the Pali commentaries, the Chinese sastra, masters, well they were not all Chinese, but those who are preserved in Chinese, they had to find some way of making sense out of the material, and sometimes that is very interesting, but it is not necessarily what the original sutta intended. So we cannot just rely on these, but we have to examine them and see if they make sense. And yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I fail to uh, see that these explanations satisfactorily uh, explain the issue. Uh, the thing is, the actual experience of stream entry, uh, uh, and this would correspond to the third of the Four Noble Truths, this is uh, uh, there is a particular moment in time where he or she experiences nirvana, 
And at that moment in time, because the experience of nirvana is one where there is no self at all in any way discernible, the view of a self gets thoroughly eradicated. And because it is such a powerful experience, there is simply no doubt about having had this experience. And because of this same powerful experience, one also knows what's the path and what's not the path. Last time I, I quoted the Ratana Sutta and I found a pal in the Mahavastu, which is from the Maha Sangika tradition, uh, tradition whose transmission uh, probably separated very early from the Theravada. So it gives us a strong confirmation of this point to have these two very different uh, transmission lineages make the same point. It is the vision of stream entry itself that cuts the three fetters. And this happens simultaneously at the same time. These are different aspects of the same thing. And if, I, if I'm if i allowed to give a little simile, uh, we might imagine that now there is an electricity failure. So my computer will go off. At the same time, the lecture will come to an end and you will no longer see me on the screen or hear me. And my computer will become all black. All these things will happen in the same very moment. Electricity failure, zoom, everything is gone. And the same is with stream entry. At that very moment of the experience of stream entry, uh, the views is purified, the doubt is gone, and one has the knowledge and vision of the way and what is not the way, etc. But the purifications, according to the simile delivered in the discourse, follow each other. They are chariots that lead up to each other. So I uh, personally, I find that it's, it's simply they do not match so well with stream entry or other stages of purification according to the levels of awakening we find in early Buddhism. If I continue to the next number four, purification by overcoming doubt, Kanka Vitarana Visuddhi, I found one passage in the Udana. There's a monk called Kankarevata and he reviews his own purification by overcoming doubt. That is what we are told. The commentary says that uh, Venerable Kankarevata at this time is an arahant, but he is reviewing his previous overcoming of doubt in relation to speculations about a self in past, present and future times and in regard to Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So if we follow the commentary explanation, this would again correspond to stream entry. Then there were several um, in the course that mentioned, uh, first there was Dania, Hedwig and Robert. All of them mentioned that it's not clear why path and way are, are different and what is actually the meaning of knowledge and vision, what does it mean. And I think you are all quite right in pointing out that these things, if we just stick to the suttas, to the sutta terminology, it's not really clear why path and way should be different. And knowledge and vision, <coughs> knowledge and vision in general, they stand for two basic qualities vision, and this is a little bit my interpretation, you could read this up in my Satipatthana book, uh, page 42, I discussed it a little bit more in detail. But we often get this like the Yatha Buddha, Jnana Dasana, the knowledge and vision according to reality. Um, for a correct appreciation of the situation, I think we need two qualities. One is the direct seeing and the other one is the understanding, the knowledge, the recognizing of what we are seeing. And I see these two qualities related to sati and sampajanya as meditative qualities. I see vision as a task of mindfulness, sati. The, the ability to fully to, to allow the situation to arrive at me to its fullest extent without me uh, at the 
perceptive level, up the first perceptive stage, already manipulating, changing, reacting, doing, simply allowing things to come to me. That is the clear, undistorted vision. And then the recognition of what this situation signifies, the knowledge. In the actual meditation context, this is then sati mindfulness, we observe. And then sampajanya, this input of clear comprehension that recognizes, oh, this is impermanent, this is unsatisfactory, this is not self, etc. And I think this is the basic flavor that I think we can see underlying this combination of these two qualities, knowledge and vision. Now, if we look for the precise terms in the suttas, then uh, for this uh, knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path, we get one more occurrences, occurrence I'm sorry, in the Anguttara Nikaya. And there it's the Buddha's knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path. And the description we get is about his insight into the nature of Kasina meditation. Kasina, uh, the word Kasina means uh, totality. And uh, nowadays the word is mostly used for the devices that are employed to develop such uh, totalities. It's basically an aspect of concentration meditation where one thing becomes total. This could be uh, uh, an element, earth, water, fire, air. It could be a color, blue. Blue is actually of, used very often by meditators, white, red. Uh, the procedure described in the commentarial tradition with Sudhimaga is that one creates um, a device, that, uh, a round device that collects this material or color, and then one looks at it and one remembers it internally, and then eventually the mind, this, this, this color or this element becomes all-encompassing. The original meaning of the term was not uh, restrained to these devices because we also have the Vijnana Casino, the totality of consciousness, which is obviously there's no device of developing that. So it's this basic idea of a totality. And the Buddha's insight into the nature of these uh, totality meditations, if I'm allowed to call them like this, is said to be his knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path. You may have already noticed this doesn't help us much further because this doesn't seem to have much to do with what we are talking about now. Seven stages of purification leading to awakening. Then the next one, Patiparanyana Dasana Visuddhi, I have not been able to find another occurrence. And purification by knowledge and vision, the Jnana Dasana Visuddhi, yes. And the, the jnana dasana as such, we have uh, uh, two discourses that are fairly similar to the Ratavinita Sutta, the Chariot Relay Sutta, the Maha Saropama, the Chula Saropama Sutta. They also have a similar procedure to so different stages of something leading up to the final goal but not being the final goal. And they both have the knowledge and vision, the jnana and dasana. And both of them clearly say jnana, dasana, knowledge and vision is not yet the final goal. It's the step before. And that's not yet the final goal, but the step before. This we could also deduce from the last two of the nine stages of purification, the listing we get in the uh, Dhyanikaya where we have eight and nine, I have them here, purification by wisdom and purification by liberation. So the liberation, full liberation, full awakening would be stage nine. Therefore seven could not be final awakening, full awakening. And we could also uh, conclude that from uh, the Anguttara Nikaya passage that I earlier used for view, where we get the Vimuti Padi Sudhi Padhani Anga, and that is also right liberation. So, the seven stages of purification, we cannot easily match them with the attainment of stream entry, as I said before. 
since the moment of stream and it completes what in the scheme of the Rata Vinita Sutta are successive stages of purification. We also have difficulties to give a meaning to this, to find a meaning for these uh, stages of purification if we base ourselves on the suttas only. The Visuddhimagga, as it is based on this, it has this as its basic scaffolding, certainly gives them a meaning. And maybe I should first give you this passage here. We go to the final of the seven. Uh, the Visuddhimagga says that uh, purification by knowledge and vision consists in knowledge of these four paths the path of stream entry, the path of one's return, the path of non-return, and the path of arahanship. This uh, stands in contrast to the passage I mentioned above from the Maha and Chula Saropama Sutta, where knowledge and vision are only what leads to realization. They are not yet full awakening. So, and uh, the Visuddhimagga, the other uh, purifications, the preceding ones. So uh, I said purification by knowledge and vision is stream entry up to arahanship. This is uh, chapter 22 in the Visuddhimagga. The preceding one, I briefly scroll up so that we have the we have them here again. So number seven, according to chapter 22 in the Visuddhimagga, is the four awakening, four levels of awakening. And the preceding one, knowledge and vision of the way, is the mature stages in the development of insight. This is from the mature stage of an insight knowledge called rise and fall, all the way up to the brink of stream and dream. And the preceding one, knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path, this is uh, the early stages in the development of insight up to rise and fall and uh, the defilements of insight. Uh, I think it, gets, it will get too much now if I get into the insight knowledges, but basically there's a, there's a early stage where one just understands the three characteristics, impermanence, uh, dukkha and not-self. And then when one gets into directly experiencing rise and fall, the uh, arising and disappearance of phenomena, there is something that the Visuddhimagga reckons the defilements of insight, vipassana upakilesa. And this could be inner visions of light, this could be uh, thinking that one has gotten somewhere. Uh, various experiences that arise during this stage and that Im become a problem because the meditator identifies these as an attainment, as having gotten somewhere. And thereby they become a defilement of insight. And when it is clearly recognized uh, through introspection or instruction given by the teacher that these are just byproducts but not the final goal and the meditator continues then he or she would be proceeding from purification 5 to purification 6. But as I said before uh, this is historically a later interpretation and uh, it is interesting to see what the commentators make out of this but um, I, it, we, we are certainly entitled to have our doubts whether this was the original idea. Yeah, then there was a comment by Linda Grace. She said, about the group of seven stages of purification, I have often wondered about that group and why it was so rare in the canon while being central to the Visuddhimagga. Why do you think the commentarial tradition relies so heavily on this particular description in terms of outlining what it sees as the development of the path? And following from this, at least one whole system of meditation and assessment was later developed, that is to say the Mahasi Vipassana meditation method. In addition to 
uh, the contradictions with descriptions of what happens with stream entry, it also seems not only relatively obscure as a grouping, but also at odds with the suttas in other ways. Yeah, I, I again would like to give this a little time because I, I think this is an important subject and I'm very glad that Linda has brought this up. It is not only the Mahasi tradition, but uh, I think the I think pretty much all the major Burmese Vipassana methods that is uh, major in the sense that they have uh, been very successful. Mahasi, Goenka and Paok uh, are basing themselves on the seven stages of purification and so this, this, this uh, scheme has played a very central role in the history of uh, Theravada Buddhism. Now to understand or to introduce why I think uh, Buddha Gosa adopted this uh, seventh system, seven stages, we need to briefly look at the history of the Visuddhimagga. We are somewhere around 400 of our time and uh, at the historical background to the situation is the struggle between two eminent monasteries in ancient Sri Lanka. One of them is called the Mahavihara, the great Vihara, the great dwelling, great monastery. And this Mahavihara, this uh, great monastery, as part of their attempt to maintain its eminency against uh, another monastery, had decided to have the commentaries, which had been transmitted in the Sinhalese language, put into Pali. This was a move to uh, strengthen its position against this other monastery called the Abhayangiri Vihara, the monastery of the fearless mountain, yeah, <laughs> whatever, which uh, had been uh, uh, very open to uh, Sanskrit texts apparently and also to so-called Mahayana works of various types. And so the Indian Buddha Gosa had come to Sri Lanka because he also was interested in these uh, commentaries and to qualify himself for the task of um, re-translating, re-putting the Sinhalese commentaries into Pali, he, according to the traditional account, composed the Visuddhimagga. And this uh, composing of the Visuddhimagga is uh, uh, said to have been something very exceptional. The Mahavangsa uh, chronicle of Sri Lankan, early Sri Lankan Buddhist history says that when he had finished, uh, the devas hid his work and he had to start again. And when he had finished that one, again they hid it and he had to start once more. So when he had written it for three times, uh, the devas, the gods, gave the other two back and they were placed side by side and lo and behold, they were all exactly the same. So he, he really knew what he was doing, according to tradition. Now from an historical perspective, it is uh, very telling that there is another work called the Vimutti Maga, the Path to Liberation by Upatissa. And this is uh, still preserved in Chinese translation. And uh, it also is a Theravada work. Some scholars have associated this with this, with this other monastery, this Abhayagiri Vihara, but that is uh, uncertain. Now, it seems according to the to Dhammapala, the commentary on the Visuddhimagga, that Buddha Gosa knew this other work. He knew the Vimuttimagga. And uh, that seems quite probable because both works follow a similar pattern. And at some points, Buddha Gosa also quotes, but he doesn't say whom he quotes. He just says, uh, some say Kenachi Vadanti or something like that. And uh, uh, several of these quotes can be found in this Vimuti Maga. So it seems he had uh, Vimuti Maga as his blueprint. But there are several differences between the two works and um, the Vimuti Maga is on the whole more practical. The Visuddhi Maga is more scholastic and also it gives a lot of stories. 
but I have the impression and I have written a little article on this which I'm posting on the web for those of you who are interested in that on several places Buddha Gosa makes a specific point of differing from his model from the Vimuti Magga. And one of these points I think is precisely the purifications. You see the Vimuti Magga takes as its basic scaffolding the Four Noble Truths and this is such an obvious scaffolding to use. The Four Noble Truths are perhaps the most central teaching we get in the early discourses. And within this exposition on the Four Noble Truths, the Vimuti Magga also refers to four purifications. Purification, virtue, mind, view and overcoming doubt. Since I think we can detect this pattern of Buddha Gosa making a point of doing some things differently in order to differ from his predecessor, I believe, but this is just my assumption, that also with the purifications Buddha Gosa decided to do it differently. So that instead of uh, four purifications he will take the whole set and use that as his uh, basic scaffolding instead of using the Four Noble Truths. The only thing is that, as far as I can see, he made a little blunder there. Because, as I said, he took, he didn't take this, he didn't, he, he took the sevenfold uh, model instead of taking the ninefold. Here there is eight and nine again, the, the, the one where, which would be a complete scheme. He took an incomplete scheme. A scheme of seven purifications that only lead up to but do not include uh, awakening. Uh, but he interpreted it in such a way that they do include awakening. So in this way I, I think that um, political decision is maybe a little bit too strong but there, there, there are some historical reasons for suspecting that this uh, seven stages of purification came to eminence because of this peculiar situation that he is composing this manual, he has this other model, he wants to do it a little differently and that he is being not too careful by he, he should have better chosen the ninefold pattern. Yeah, there is still one short thing and then I'll give some time for questions. It's another comment by Linda. Yeah, I think unless there's something burning I would like to still... Yeah, I still throw this at you. Maybe before I should just briefly say that the Visuddhimagga has a lot of interesting and good passages. Please don't take me as somebody who is uh, just wanting to spit on the commentarial tradition and the uh, main manual of the Theravada tradition, but just that I, I uh, when, let me put it differently, when uh, consulting the Visuddhimagga and certain points it makes, and this is just the same I was earlier saying about uh, passage from Tattva Siddhi and Yoga Achara Bhumi, it is good if we have in mind the historical situation where they come from and that we see besides their strength also their limitations. Anyhow, so Linda uh, uh, had another question uh, Linda Grace, and she says a question related to Sariputta. Why do you think he wanted to conceal, or at least not reveal, <coughs> excuse me, his identity, as well as the fact that he knew who Mantaniputta was? It seems kind of tricky, even a bit deceptive, although this is too strong a word. I know at the end Mantaniputta rejoices and says that he had known had he known it was Sariputta, he would not have been able to answer so deeply. But that doesn't explain Sariputta's motivation, but only indicates that it was effective in terms of Mantaniputta feeling uninhibited to talk freely. And uh, Manfred had already given an answer to that. Yeah, I'm just sharing this with you because I think it's, uh, it's really significant uh, questions and answers. He says, there's a similar instance in Majjhima Nikaya 140 where the Buddha does not reveal his identity to one of his students, 
who does not recognize him. And there are several suttas where arahants ask each other questions, despite the fact that both must know the answers. Yeah, I think that's just nice to keep that in mind, that uh, there are often passages where the disciples will ask a question of the Buddha, but we need not always assume that they do not know what they're asking. There's a scheme of different types of question and some of the questions uh, recognized in this scheme are basically just for the sake of discussion wanting maybe to be something drawn out clearly for other people who are present even though the speaker himself or herself already knows and there is a particularly nice instance that I would like to add to the reference that Manfred has already given us Majimanikaya 44, we have a basic setting according to the Pali commentary tradition. There's a little background story, but we have the basic setting. There is a layman, and he asks a nuns a series of deep questions. And according to the commentary explanation, uh, the story behind that goes that this layman, his name is Visaka, he had been practicing as a layman and had uh, reached stream entry uh, once return and then eventually even non-return. And when he had become a non-returner, he came back home and he told his wife, look, uh, uh, we can't live anymore together in the way before as man and wife. So what would you like to do? I mean, would you like to marry someone else? And I'll, I'll, Is there anybody or and I'll give you uh, wealth and I support you but then she said no uh, I actually can the same thing that you got also be realized by women and Visaka says certainly so so let me become a nun and so she becomes a nun she goes off to meditate because uh, when she had ordained there were all her relatives and friends coming to visit her and she found that disturbing and very soon after she comes back. So Visaka is wondering now, what's happened? Why she came back so quickly? Between the lines, uh, she had already become an Arahant, but he doesn't know. So he thinks that she has maybe come back because she found it too difficult to be alone as a nun meditating in seclusion. And so he puts all these very tricky questions at her. They are really tricky in the sense of uh, he, he, he goes from something very simple zoop, right into a very deep question and you can sense behind somebody's asking this question who has very deep meditation, meditation experience and she masters them all. I have just uh, written another of my articles uh, based on the Tibetan parallel to this which is coming out at some point later this year and I personally think that this could be a precedent for what the practice of debate in uh, later Buddhist traditions and we get this especially in the Tibetan traditions you might have heard about this uh, formal debating practices where they they have this they have this hitting with each arguments and one has to defend and the other one is is, is, is asking questions this is a very strong form of debate but uh, the, the basic idea of a debate between Buddhist disciples and not, not, not to, to, to put down the other, not to harm or hurt, but to, 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 to tickle out some deeper understanding of the Dharma and to stand one's ground is something we can already to some extent see in this, in this discourse, Majjhimanikaya 44, the Pali version is the Chula Vidala Sutta. Yeah, these were the things I had uh, to add on the very, very useful and interesting comments in the blog. Also, those who I have not quoted. It's getting a, a very uh, rewarding experience for me to look at the blog and see the comments and ideas that people make. And on the purifications. Now, I would like to give a moment if there is any question or comment on the purifications. There's a comment by Manfred. 
did Buddha Gosa connect the inside knowledges to the purification and where does the list of inside knowledges appear in the suttas? Yeah, the inside knowledges, I have written a paper on that for the Encyclopedia of Buddhism and there I try to find out if these inside knowledges have a correspondent in the suttas and I have been successful in finding the terminology in pretty much all of the instances of these inside knowledges. And in another paper that has, uh, still hasn't come out as part of proceedings of a conference on meditation, I have uh, matched uh, the basic pattern that underlies the inside knowledges with a progression that we find in the suttas of the three characteristics. We get a teaching in the suttas that uh, the three characteristics lead on, one leads on to the next. There is anicca, the impermanence, and then in what is impermanent one sees that it is dukkha, and then in what is in dukkha one sees that it is not self. This is uh, this teaching is found in a series of sannyas perceptions, and it also underlies instructions like uh, I think Anatta Lakana Sutta we find it the first discourse that uh, the, the 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 excuse me the discourse the the first discourse that led to arahant attainments among the Buddha's disciples, and if we look closely at the inside knowledges we find that although they start off with all three characteristics, the afterwards the pattern underlying these inside knowledges corresponds to the same basic pattern. So the inside knowledges as such are later, definitely, but the terms occur in the suttas and the basic pattern they describe also occur in the suttas. And the matching of these inside knowledges with the purifications to my knowledge is uh, the work of Buddha Gosa. That is what I think I mentioned briefly before that in uh, chapter, what is it, 20, 21, 22, I think, of the Visuddhimagga, I'm now quoting from memory, uh, he, he, he shows the development of the inside knowledge and matches it with the seven stages of purification. But I think that the relationship between the scheme of inside knowledge and the purifications is not a necessary one. I'd love to talk more about the inside knowledge, but then the whole session will be lost on what I'm not supposed to be doing. But thank you very much for allowing me this uh, question and getting into it shortly. And I, I have a look if maybe I should also post the paper on. Let's see what people on the blog said. If there's more interest in the inside knowledge, I can also post that paper. Yeah. Then uh, now we come to the topic of ethics. Purification, ethics and karma. Obviously the three terms are closely interrelated and uh, if we get through with what I want to do on ethics today, that next time we'll be touching on karma. Ethics is a concern that is absolutely central in early Buddhism through and through ethics and it is based on this basic distinction between what is wholesome and what is unwholesome kusala and akusala and there is the what I believe is uh, uh, the Buddha's own realization of this important distinction on the eve of his awakening. If we uh, uh, if we just briefly review, there's a passage in Bodhi Raja Kumara Sutta where the Buddha says that before his awakening he also accepted the belief common in ancient India that to gain liberation all pleasure has to be shunned. And this is quite evident from his undertaking of ascetic practices. The whole story I briefly review is that he went forth in search of the Supreme uh, 
some sources indicate that he had some preliminary training in meditation. This is not found in the Pali tradition, where he meets two teachers who teach him the way to the immaterial attainments, <coughs> excuse me, specifically to nothingness, Alara Kalama, and uh, Uraka, the son of Rama, his father had attained neither perception nor non-perception. And the Buddha in both cases masters these attainments and is then asked by these teachers to either be the co-teacher or in the case of Udaka, he asks him to be, I think, the only teacher. And the Buddha refuses because these are not what he has been looking for. In short, the development of these highly rarefied experiences, the transcending of the world in deep profound meditation has not yet solved the problem he's looking for. And so instead he confronts it now head on. We are told in the Mahasachika Sutta that he did various uh, exercises of breathing control, pranayama, and also that he went, underwent various fasts. The Buddha's ascetic practices, it needs to be mentioned that there's another discourse, the Mahasihanara Sutta, where he describes various ascetic practices. But as a German Buddhist scholar Helmut Hecker has already pointed out, uh, some of these do not refer to his present lifetime, but uh, to past lifetimes when he has been an Ajivaka. So the ascetic practices that are really relevant for our present uh, consideration are this uh, breath control and fasting practices. And he finds he is reducing himself to a condition where uh, there is no realization and if he continues like that uh, there will also be no further living for him. He stops and he reflects, he looks back. And I presume he first looks back at what he has done so far, his ascetic practices, the experience of the immaterial spheres. He realizes that both have not led him further, and he looks further back. And he remembers um, uh, uh, an experience of the first absorption he had uh, some time ago. Again, the sources differ. The Pali tradition, the Pali commentary tradition, and Milinda Panya, I believe, hold that he was a small infant, but other sources say that he was a young man probably, <clears throat> be that as it may, he reflects and here comes the reflection that according to the Mahasachika Sutta he had, he says, why am I afraid of a happiness that is separate from sensual pleasures and unwholesome states? I am not afraid of a happiness that is separate from sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. That is, <clears throat> the realization that the pleasure of the first jhana is not something to be feared. This marks the decisive turning point in the Buddha's quest for awakening. He had attained the first jhana before as a young man, and he must have developed them when he was getting the teachings on the immaterial attainments because in the discourse uh, we get the description that he says that this, what his former teachers have taught him did not satisfy him because it only leads to rebirth in those corresponding realms. This can only be the case if uh, these are the full immaterial attainments based on jhanic strength of mind. And in another discourse we also get the story of one of these teachers being able to sit in deep meditation while there's uh, an incredible noise around him. So they must have been very deep practitioners. So the question at this point, according to my understanding, this is my interpretation of the passage, please, is not uh, the first jhana as such, but rather the realization, look, pleasure is not something one necessarily needs to run away from. The question is not pleasure or pain. The, ple the question is, is it wholesome or is it unwholesome? Pleasure that is wholesome can be used for, the, for progress on the path. 
And this is, I think, uh, uh, to my understanding, this is absolutely decisive understanding, and it is this that opens the path to the Buddha's awakening. Because then he sees this claim, same distinction, wholesome and unwholesome. He looks further back. He sees his own past lives. This is precisely what has made me be reborn here, reborn there. He sees the lives of others. This is precisely what makes others be reborn high and low. Principle of karma, conditionality. Always this distinction, wholesome, unwholesome. And it's precisely the roots of unwholesomeness that he has to eradicate in his own mind. The asavas, the influxes, to which we will turn soon, which marks his full awakening. Should I give you time for a question, if there is one? Good, then I continue. There's, a, there's another discourse uh, I have. This is not the, yet the one I'm putting up here. The Chula Dukkha Kanda Sutta, where the, we also have several Chinese parallels, where the Buddha makes the uh, uh, interesting point that he says that in as much as the experience of happiness and pleasure is concerned, he has more fun, if I may use that word, than even the king of the country. So again, the question is, Obviously, the two types of happiness that the king has and the Buddha has are quite different. But the question is, we do not need to shun happiness on the path to awakening. It just has to be sure that it's the wholesome one. And there's another passage, and this is the second one here on the blackboard. There are some monks who are not willing to follow the Buddha's instruction. They uh, are not shunning pleasure, they are indulging pleasure, but even in the one that they should not be indulging in. And so he says, because it is known by me, seen, found, realized, contacted by wisdom. Here, when someone feels a certain kind of pleasant feelings, unwholesome states increase in him, and wholesome states diminish. Therefore, I say, abandon such a kind of pleasant feeling. And because it is known by me, seen, found, realized, contacted by wisdom. Thus, here when someone feels another kind of pleasant feelings, unwholesome states diminish in him and wholesome states increase. Therefore, I say, enter upon, abide in such a kind of pleasant feelings. It's the same basic principle the Buddha has himself found out. These type of pleasant feelings, they lead you down. Don't get into that. These type of pleasant feelings, like the pleasure of deep concentration, they lead you up. Engage in them. Yeah, this um, basic distinction between what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, I see it as a red th thread running through the whole of the teachings, from beginning to end. And I would just like to note that this is not only the most crucial and basic distinction of the path to awakening, but also of full awakening attained itself. Genuine insight in the early Buddhist teachings is not only in need of having a sound moral basis, it will also in turn strengthen this moral foundation and makes certain unwholesome deeds an impossibility for someone who has deeper insight. And so with the culmination point of the Arahant, we reach a stage where he or she is simply incapable of doing certain unwholesome deeds. These are listed here. We are quotation number three. An Arahant with taints destroyed, who is completely liberated through final knowledge, is incapable of transgression in five cases. He or she is incapable of deliberately depriving a living being of life, of taking what is not given, that is, of stealing, indulging in sexual intercourse, knowingly speaking falsehood, and enjoying sensual pleasures by storing them up as he or she did formerly in lay life. <coughs> There's no 
crazy wisdom guru in early Buddhism. Anybody who presents himself as a teacher in the early Buddhist tradition is measurable by standards of moral conduct and violating any of these basic standards, such a teacher cannot claim to be awakened. And another aspect in regard to ethics that I just wanted to come back to is again these asavas, these influxes, which we will discuss now. And each of the rules in the Vinaya, the code of conduct for monks and nuns, is said to be for restraining present asavas and for countering future asavas. Yeah, that is my introduction into the topic of ethics. If there is any question or comment, now would be a good moment. So then we go a little bit into the next discourse, which is precisely on the asavas, on the taints or influxes. <coughs> we are Madhyama Agama number 10, the discourse on the cessation of the taints, and this is the parallel to the Sabhasava Sutta, the second discourse in the Majjhima Nikaya. Thus have I heard at one time the Buddha was staying among the Kurus at a Kuru town called Kamasa Dhamma. At that time the Blessed One addressed the monks. Through knowing and seeing one attains the cessation of the taints, not without knowing and seeing. How does one attain the cessation of the taints through knowing and seeing? There is right attention and there is wrong attention. If one engages in wrong attention, then the not yet arisen taint of sensual desire will arise, and the arisen taint of sensual desire will increase. The not yet arisen taints of existence and ignorance will arise, and the arisen taints of existence and ignorance will increase. There are three basic taints here, or asavas mentioned. This is the teaching we find in the early discourses, sensual desire, existence and ignorance. The discourse continues. There are seven ways of abandoning the taints, which cause distress, vexation, dejection and sorrow. What are the seven? There are taints that are to be abandoned through, and here I list them. Seeing, uh, guarding, avoiding, using, enduring, removing and attending. Get a fairly similar list in the Pali parallel, and I give the Pali terminology for those of you who like to refer to that. Uh, we s if you look here uh, on the right side, uh, you see that there is uh, just a difference in sequence. Uh, where Pali version E avoiding corresponds to number three in the Madhyama Agama, and because this has uh, jumped down the line, then four and five have jumped down one up. This is a uh, recurrent occurrence we find in all transmission. I think I mentioned that earlier that we get listings and uh, midway of the listings usually the first and the last stay the same but midway of the listing there is some uh, mix up in the in the sequence. Uh, somehow it got uh, the, the sequence differed and often we cannot really say which is the better or the more original sequence. It just it just has, it's just different. Okay, let us get into the seven. I think we can maybe go through the seven still. Have a little time. Number one, taints abandoned through seeing. So, uh, the foolish whirling who does not know the Dharma as it really is. Such a person, through not practicing right attention, has the following thoughts. I was in the past. I was not in the past. From what cause was I in the past? How was I in the past? I will be in the future. I will not be in the future. From what cause will I be in the future? 
how will I be in the future? He wonders about himself in the present or about herself. What is this so-called self? How did it come to be? This present sentient being, from where has it come? Where will it go? Rooted in what cause does it exist? From what future cause will it exist? We have a somewhat related listing of views concerning the notion of a self in the Pali parallel. And this leads to the arising in both versions of various views. Uh, I don't want to go into this in detail now. We just look at the proper vision. Uh, the learned noble disciple who knows the Dharma as it really is, knows Dukkha, knows the arising of Dukkha, the cessation and the path leading to cessation of Dukkha as it really is. This is his, his correct vision. Through his having come to know this as it really is, three fetters cease. Personality view, clinging to precept and doubt. Through the cessation of these three fetters, he attains stream entry. He will not fall into evil conditions and is assured of progress towards right awakening within at most seven existences. Having gone through at most seven existences in the heavens or among human beings, he will attain the ending of Dukkha or she. Yeah, I think I just continue going through them. The others are a little shorter. But the basic contrast, just for us to summarize, is the uh, empty speculations on the existence of a self are contrasted to the vision of the Four Noble Truth. To looking at Dukkha, how it comes about, how it is made to cease, and what is the practical way to undertake that. The second is how it attains abundance through guarding. A monk on seeing a form with the eye guards the eye faculty and with right attention contemplates impurity. <coughs> The contemplation of impurity is a specific uh, point made in the Madhyamagma. We don't have that in the Pali. I continue. He is not guarding the eye faculty if, uh, without right intention, he is contemplating purity. If one does not guard the eye faculty, then distress, vexation, dejection and sorrow will arise. But if one does guard it, distress, vexation, dejection and sorrow will not arise. Similar for the ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. So in both versions, there's a basic description of sense restraint as one way of dealing with the asavas. And the uh, only small but noticeable difference is that the uh, Madhyama Agama version adds the reference to contemplating impurity or purity. Number three, how are taints abandoned through avoiding? A monk, on seeing a vicious elephant, should avoid it. And similarly, a vicious horse, a vicious ox, a vicious dog, a poisonous snake, a dangerous path, a ditch or pit, a cesspool, a river, a deep spring, a mountain precipice, a bad companion, a bad friend, an evil heretic, an evil neighbor, a bad abode, or anything that would cause doubt to rise in his previously undoubting companions in the holy life, that he should avoid. How are taints abandoned through using? A monk does not use his ropes for the sake of gain, nor out of pride, nor for the sake of adornment, but for protection against mosquitoes, gadflies, wind, rain, cold and heat, and out of shame by concealing the private parts. I think I don't read this out to you. I just notice there is one difference. There's also one error here that should be number four. I'm sorry. I have to correct that later on. Yeah, I just stay with the first. The robes in the Pali version are 
for sake of adornment that makes sense but now if you look at the next one in the Chinese version he does not use food or drink for the sake of gain, nor out of pride, nor the for the pleasure of growing fat, but to maintain the body and remove distress, vexation, dejection and sorrow. In the Pali version, we again get the topic of adornment. And adornment, which in the case of robes makes some sense, in the case of food and drink is a little difficult to understand and I, I researched that and I, I, I wrote on that also in general the terms we find for adornment usually refer to external embellishment wearing garlands and bracelets and similar things and so that that makes sense for robes in fact there's a passage somewhere where one monk wears iron robes and so he gets a rebuke from the Buddha for that but not really for food the Visuddhimagga explains that one might take food in order to become fat this is what we have also in the Madhyama argument, the growing fat or to have a clear skin as some harem women or actors might do find this a little contrived explanation and difficult also to apply to the situation of a monk and nun directly. Anyhow, it seems to me more natural that adornment was originally only meant for robes and in a oral transmission it could very easily happen that a quality recited in the first passage by mistake comes to be mentioned again in the second passage which otherwise is worded very similarly anyhow we get abodes and dwelling places and decoctions and medicines in all of these four cases these four basic requisites of a monk should basically made use of but should not be sources of pleasure or pride etc method number five how are attains abandoned through enduring to energetically abandon evil and unwholesome states and develop wholesome states a monk continuously arouses the mind to wholehearted diligent effort thinking even if the body skin flesh tendons, bones, blood and marrow should all dry up. I will not stop striving. Not until the goal has been attained will I stop striving. This whole part is not found in the Pali passage. And my personal impression is that this could be a later edition. The second is similar. Here we get the description that enduring is about a monk should endure hunger and thirst, cold and heat, mosquitoes, gadflies, flies, fleas and lice, being assailed by wind and sun, being verbally abused and being beaten with sticks, he is able to endure it all. Even if the body suffers disease, causing such extreme pain that his life seems to come to an end. Whatever is unpleasant, he is able to endure it all. How are taints abandoned through removing? When thoughts of sensual desire arise, a monk removes, discards, abandons and gets rid of them. When thoughts of ill will or harming arise, he removes, discards, abandons and gets rid of them. Yeah. And the final, how are taints abandoned through attending in the Pali version that speaks of developing bhavana? A monk attends to mindfulness, the first factor of awakening, based on seclusion, dispassion and cessation, and leading to emancipation. The last is different. In the Pali we have a ripening in relinquishment instead of leading to emancipation. But this is... Uh, difference in word that does not affect the meaning. 
He attends to investigation of phenomena, to energy, to joy, to tranquility, to concentration, and he attends to equanimity, the seventh factor of awakening, based on seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, leading to emancipation. If a monk, through seeing, abandons the taints that are to be abandoned through seeing, through guarding, abandons the taints that are to be abandoned through guarding, through avoiding, abandons the taints that are to be abandoned through avoiding, through using, abandons the taints that are to be abandoned through using, through enduring, abandons the taints that are to be abandoned through enduring, through removing, abandons the taints that are to be abandoned through removing, through attending, abandons the taints that are to be abandoned through attending. Then he is called a monk who has abandoned all taints and has been liberated from all bondage, who has, through right knowledge, been able to make an end of Dukkha. This is where the discourse concludes. And I have been reading this last passage in full, hopefully not straining your patience too much by this tedious reading, because I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that in each of these seven cases, the sutta speaks of abandoning taints. This makes it clear, I think, because these seven methods cannot easily be matched with the three taints or influxes mentioned at the beginning, sensual desires, existence and ignorance, that this sutta is using the term asava, influx, taint, in a broader manner. It cannot be restricted to the three standardly enumerated types. Here are the three, again, sensual desire, existence and ignorance. There is uh, sometimes a fourth mention, the influx or taint of view. This appears only in one single discourse and only in the PTS edition, namely the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which anyway is a rather complex discourse uh, with uh, several parts that scholars have identified as reflecting later developments. And it is not found in any other discourses and also not found in the Asian editions, that is the Burmese Siamese and Silonese editions of this discourse. The fourth asava is regularly found in uh, Abhidharma and commentaries. So we can be fairly sure that these three asavas, these three taints or influxes are the early presentation. There's an argument made by one Sri Lankan, I think it's Sri Lankan Buddha Rakita, one scholar that we should understand the influx of view is automatically in included in the second of the three, the influx of existence, because only when one, he says, when only when there is an ideological base which confirms becoming, then one has the uh, the influx for existence. And um, yeah, I think I'm not going to go into this in detail now, but basically I made a research on different passages. And I think, for example, the view, <coughs> uh, the denial of causality are attributed to one uh, her contemporary teacher in the Samanya Pala Sutta is probably easier related to the influx of ignorance than the influx of existence. And then in another discourse, we get uh, someone having kind of hedonistic views, indulgence in sensuality is no problem. So this I would uh, more relate to sensual desire. In some, it seems to me that the influx of views is not already covered by these three and just a natural drawing out. Although I think <clears throat> we can make an argument if we look at this uh, whole set of seven that in this particular discourse that we have just been examining, <coughs> the first of these seven methods is precisely about view, the view of the noble truths instead of the wrong 
different views of itself. So we can see this perhaps as an antecedent, but the idea of a fourth asava is a slightly later development. And on the term, I also want to briefly say something. Asava occurs in one passage in the Anguttara Nikaya. I just paste in the reference for you if anybody wants to see that, where it stands for a discharge from a festering sore. So it's something that that uh, when a sore is struck, it it will it will discharge ever more. And there has been some discussion. Uh, some scholars think uh, that the term asava is uh, borrowing from the Jaina tradition. In the Jaina tradition, the term asava is uh, very central and it describes something that flows in. It describes how through evil, unwholesome action, uh, a, a substance kind of thing flows in onto the self and covers it. And the passage from Anguttara Nikaya gives more the feeling of an outflow instead of an inflow. It gives this feeling of a sore that is struck and it festers, comes out, it flows out. So there are some scholars who think uh, that uh, in a way this term was borrowed from uh, the giants and is a little bit maladapted to its Buddhist usage. I venture to disagree. Uh, in fact, uh, I have on my side a German scholar of Jainism, Alsdorf, who already uh, suggested in 1965 that this need not be a boring from the Jains, but both could have drawn on an existing term in ancient Indian usage. And also Professor Schmidhausen, who also really points out that the term asava in Buddhist text does not only refer to outflow but has a wider range in meaning. And I think if we now look at these seven methods again, let us just briefly go through them once more. <clears throat> Each of them for the overcoming of these asava. So one is see the noble truths. The second one is guarding the sense doors. The third one is avoiding what is dangerous and unsuitable. The fourth one is using things properly. The fifth one is enduring various vicissitudes. The sixth one is removing what is unwholesome. And the seventh one is developing, attending the awakening factors. There is no necessarily outflow or inflow here. I think uh, we can use both and there is no, no, no clear cut thing that this is only flowing outwards or only flowing inwards. In fact, with number number two, we, we obviously have an inflow. One guards the sense doors to avoid that something flows in. So basically, I'm, I, I do not think that this the term asava, who is so central and crucial to early Buddhist thought, needs to be seen as a maladapted borrowing from the Jain tradition. And coming back now, <coughs> I have two more minutes to go. Coming back now to our main topic of ethics, I find this uh, seven-fold presentation extremely meaningful as practical instructions on how to, how to develop a practical ethics for lay people or monks. The first one, the, the, see, the see the noble truths, take, uh, uh, spend our time in, 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 in looking at what is meaningful in particular taking responsibility for suffering or unpleasantness in our lives by realizing that there is the contributing factor of my own craving that is part of the whole situation, guarding the sense doors, knowing that certain things are not good for me to look at them, to participate in them, that there is something very beautiful, this mind, that I need to protect from this outward distractions that the modern sensuous world is throwing at it. And avoid what is dangerous. It is meaningful to avoid certain things. Sometimes people who meditate are accused of escapism. 
it is possible that some people use meditation as escapism. I do not want to debate that. But the basic principle of avoiding something that is not suitable is a very meaningful thing. And it's not an escapism, it's wisdom actually. Number four, using things properly. I mean, don't have to talk about this much nowadays with resources and the destruction of the world is facing. It's very important to use things properly. And number five, there are stuff that we just have to go through. There are things we have to endure. And we just patiently endure them. And the last two, we come into the realm of proper meditation, chuck out unwholesome, and develop the factors of awakening. Yeah, it's a nice topic on which to conclude my lecture. I'm still in time. Yeah, I thank you very much for being so patient with me, listening to all my talking on, talking on, talking on about this and that. And I look forward to your comments and questions in the blog. And I wish you a good time. Good much. I hope some, I, I, I believe, uh, if not for me, at least for the Sutta, some meaningful thought for reflection until next week. Uh, thank you very much.